Welcome to Tales from the Rabbit Hole. I'm your host, Mick West. My guest today is a flat earther, someone who actually believes that the earth is flat, or at least believes that the earth is not a spinning ball in space. Someone who has a lot of questions about the very nature of our reality. And so I thought it'd be interesting to ask this person about what's going on now, about the coronavirus and about the effect it's having in the world, and how they view this change in the world. Do they think it's some kind of artificial change that's been hoisted upon the world? Or do they think that the coronavirus is real? And how does it work when you believe that the world is some kind of illusion that it's actually flat when everyone else is saying it's round? How do you fit this kind of weird, strange disconnect with reality into a reality that forces itself upon you when people you know, perhaps, or people you know, friends of friends, start to die from coronavirus? When does reality kind of hit home? And do you ever stop questioning the nature of that reality? And should you? Okay, you are now being recorded. Um, hi, how are you? All right. I'm I'm doing good. Uh, so this is this is actually the first Tales from the Rabbit Hole podcast that I've recorded for quite a while because uh, you know I've kind of uh, been so distracted by this coronavirus uh, thing that's going on that it's it's going to really make it difficult for me to focus on other things. So how have you uh, been? I've had the same experience. I've felt very, um, my, my focus has been taken by yeah. it in a huge way. I've wanted to carry on as usual as much as possible, but certainly that's been a not not easy to do. Um, yeah, I haven't, I, I, I got to be honest, I haven't checked in in your podcast. I'm so sorry. I don't even know what's been going on in your general uh, research or views or whatever. You could tell me about that if you want to. Yeah, well, I've had, I've had quite a variety of people on uh, on, my, on my podcast. I, 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 you know, I cover all kinds of different topics. So uh, I did actually just have a guy who was a flat earther on, and he was oh, yeah. a a former flat earther. It's not often you actually get to talk to someone who used to be a believer in the flat earth and now isn't. I actually did meet one guy recently who identified in that way. It was interesting because he was he was kind of joining in the podcast and he was a very nice guy and it was fun to talk to him. And I didn't realize at first that that was sort of his position and it was coming out and I was like, oh, so you're a former flat earther. You know, I was like, mm-hmm. tell me, like what, what brought you in or what let uh, made you leave or whatever. He started talking about it and it was just, it was interesting because, the things he was saying, I was like, well, you weren't really a flat earther to begin with. <laughs> he was like, he was like, yes, I was. And I was like, all right, well, you can identify any way you want. But it was interesting because I I was very curious to hear, to hear what that would be like for somebody. And I guess when he was talking about it, I was like, well, yeah, I don't think you ever a flat earther, but it's great to have you here. Because to be honest, sometimes it's kind of boring with just flat earthers, because it's like, oh, it's just nice to have like a, you know, a little bit of like, I'm going to ask you something and you're going to ask me something. It's like yeah. nice, nice to be around. Just a gentle, kind, fun disagreement. It's fun. So, so I guess like from from that, obviously, you are still, you still identify as a flat earther. That's how you described yourself uh, last time. I don't, I don't to... Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I still don't believe in the spinning ball. Right. So I, I don't... Um, I mean, the label seems to get more and more like they just, I don't know, it's a kind of tense time out there with headlines and the way people talk about things. So I guess the 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 question of the shape of the world, I'm still very much, I don't see, I don't see it as a globe. And I don't think that's going to change. But, um, yeah, because yeah. last last time we talked, I remember we we kind of like you told me a bit about your story and how you started out uh, with the flat Earth, and yeah, you gave me this uh, this one example of something that convinced you, which was this uh, difference in the speed of the Earth between the equator and and say the UK, and uh, yeah. how how yeah you would have to change speed to get from one place to the other, and you thought that would be a very uh, noticeable thing, and you. You, you don't think it is noticeable? It, do you you remember talking about that? I do, I do absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 
to say convince me, you could you could kind of put it like that. But the way that I would say is like that there was a series of questions that mm-hmm. I thought about, and then I would go research, and then it would be like it'd be like compounding evidence. So, um, but that was a pivotal a pivotal stage in exploring things. Very, I still think that's very good evidence to question if we're if the Earth is spinning. Right. Like I've sort of like how how can I explain it in other ways? So I'll pull up this, this different example. If you're running a race, mm-hmm. you're running like a three mile sprint or something, and you just go at breakneck speed. You run three miles, and suddenly you cross the finish line and you stop. What does that feel like when you stop? You can feel yeah, everything in your body stuff, uh, is adjusting. You, you yeah. and it's not because some external force is pushing you down or put pushing you forward. It's because you have to stop yourself. <laughs> you have to have an internal adjustment. All you, <laughs> you, you, you feel you feel the fact that mm-hmm. you just slow down. And but that, you're slowing down <laughs> instantly. This is very different from well, slowing down over ten hours or nine hours. You can, you can, well, but you slow down from a rate of three. You know, you slow down. Well, whatever. Right. It, so you so you're running as fast as you can. Hours. You're running so at ten miles an you... hour. You slow down in one second. That's ten miles per hour over one second. Versus going from you know this four hundred mile per hour over. 10 hours it's very very different 400 miles per hour is what 10 miles per hour times 40 but okay, so uh nine hours you're... is one second times uh one sixty times 60 times nine so what you're saying is basically that there is a change you do have to adjust it but on mm-hmm. the earth you you it's such a subtle change you shouldn't yeah. expect to notice is that what you're saying Essentially, yeah, yeah. and like we we can do the math. Like I just said, that sixty times sixty times nine is the number of seconds in in nine hours, which is the time it takes to fly from London to India. I remember that because they always said uh, India only nine hours away on the uh, the commercials. So sixty times sixty times nine is uh, thirty two thousand four hundred. So we're talking about. We've got 32,400 times as much time to slow down as that one second you do when you, when you finish the race. Okay. Let, me, let me ask you that. In what way do you observe the change? In what way do you observe the fact that you have to slow down? Even if, even if it's subtle, it should be observable. Where, I mean, Not and really. I don't even really agree it's subtle, but if it's, even if what you're saying is true and that it would be subtle, it it should still be something that can be detected. Not and really, so because how... there's so many other things going on. The plane is actually speeding up and slowing down as it flies to uh, larger amounts than you, you're actually talking about here, like over time. Because it might have to change speed from, say, 400 miles per hour to 390 miles per hour uh, if it needs to change altitude, if it needs to get higher or lower. Saying that... that... The, the the variance of near zero at the poles to a, a, th- a thousand miles per yeah. hour at the equator yeah. should not be a variance that anybody that can detect notice. with any any device for all the scientific. Oh, you could you could do it with a have. device. You could do it with a device. You certainly can, and it does actually have an effect if you want to fly directly from uh, from the poles to the equator. There's actually you know, you, you can't just you have to kind of take that into account to some degree, but really, that's not how planes navigate. They don't. They don't just say, "I'm going to fly in this direction uh, for a certain amount of time, and I'll be there because that's the direction I set out in." the The effects of the wind are far greater than any of these these changes over that distance, because you, you're facing things like a hundred mile per hour side wind, or a headwind, or a tailwind, and it changes as you go as you fly around the globe. The wind changes, so you've got these huge changes in wind speed that you have to uh, account for with the uh, the acceleration of the or the engines or adjusting them up or down. So this very very small adjustment over time to get an extra 400 miles per hour in one one direction 
is really not going to be measurable. It's the same thing as if you were running a race. Let's say you're running a 10K race. You start out running. You're running at a good clip at the start. You're doing six miles per hour. When you finish the race, you're a bit tired, so you're only running at five miles per hour. Are you going to notice that slowdown of one mile per hour over the course of that that uh, that 10k race? It takes you 30 or 40 minutes. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people would actually. I think that variance is detectable. I mean, we we feel it all the time. It is we're a, we're a world of observing variance. Mm. There, like if and and a pattern of variance. So the wind is a great example. The wind should be largely affected by this variance but it's it's somewhat erratic and it's not it, i mean you can act, you can actually look at weather patterns and it looks like wow it looks looks like somebody's stirring the flat earth i mean I, i'm sure you've seen that they make they take weather patterns and they flatten the earth model and they show you the weather weather patterns yeah. and it looks like the sun is basically heating up the uh the air and is essentially kind of stirring the atmosphere with motion or stirring the you know, the lower the lower atmosphere with its with its motion and the weather patterns just um just it's as shocking to see that's one of the you think that kind of indicates shocking. a flat earth the weather patterns well it's it's hard to say i mean but it it sure well it sure uh, could support it if you look at these, hmm. have you ever looked at images where they say uh, like flat earth weather patterns? Uh, I mean, it's quite sh- to look I, at I, it. I, I have um, not, but oh, either, yeah, let I, me, I guess the, you. yeah, yeah, look one up. The, I the, mean, I don't, I'm not a weather expert. You know, there's, there's areas where it's like, wow, that's, that actually really makes me think, but it's like, you know, I don't know. I'm not, a, but it's, I'm going to send it to you right now. You're, you're well, welcome to. What you think about it. Sure. I mean, the the big thing, though, about the weather patterns on the Earth is that in the northern hemisphere on the globe, the weather goes one way, and in the southern hemisphere, it goes the other way. Now, if the, the Earth was just a flat disk that's just you know, doing nothing, just sat there, uh, or even if it's rotating, then why is it different in the middle than it is around the edges? Why is there, why is there an equator at all? Oh, well, you know, I don't know what the true flat earth model is at all, but if you go with the sort of first idea of this, um, you know, where the North Pole is in the center and the South Pole is uh-huh. an outer circle direction, um, then you have the sun circling low and close. And oh. you have, which means, which means that it's literally closer to the ocean and land along its path mm-hmm. than it would be to the North Pole or to the outer edge. So you would basically get a hot circle um, that would be exactly in line with the equator. You'd get, you'd get exactly the weather that we get with a close local circling sun. Um, I just sent you the. It's just like a Google search of the flat earth weather patterns. And um, and then what, what you also get is these sort of weather patterns that are a reaction to this close local sun path. So you get sort of outward spiraling of storms and weather mm-hmm. that, I mean, it, it actually makes a lot of sense if, we're, if that's what was going on. And I don't, I don't claim this is a conclusive yeah. proof that that's but it's amazing how it <laughs> like wow it's that, that it's amazing how you sense. can fit things into a, into a, a, a pattern into, into a, a model uh, if you really try hard enough uh, of course the it raises a bunch of other problems like if the sun is actually this thing that's rotating over the equator then why does it always look exactly the same size from wherever you are on the earth oh yeah people have done a lot of they've done a lot about that so there are a lot of um, things that people say about that, and one is that um, when there's moisture in the air, it gives you an optical effect. So as something physically recedes from your view, the moisture mm. in the air will actually magnify it. 
in like a coinciding process. So the there's sun no, could have there's no actual to... model as to how that actually works, is there? There's no actual no one's actually done the math and saying this is this is what actually goes on. No one's done the science. No one's actually analyzed how moisture affects things like that. Well, I think it's pretty verify you can see that water magnifies things i mean you can just go in a swimming pool and then look at your friend who's swimming and their leg looks giant if it's underwater as opposed to their body up above the water but the sun isn't I mean, underwater no but the air is full of water we've got little droplets of moisture but that, that, throughout that, that the doesn't air. doesn't actually magnify in the same way if you got if you're looking through air it's like as, as if you are actually underwater it doesn't actually doesn't actually work like that uh, well, sure, it's not, you're not actually underwater, but there is a degree of, yeah. I mean, you so, know, I mean, but again, though, like, like that, you can have optical you know, th things happen because of things that are in the air. You do have, um, you do have an effect of what you're looking through. Anything you're looking through is going to affect what you're seeing. Sure, so, but we, we know the effect that we know the effect that it has, and we know the effect that the air has on things as you get further away, and you can kind of measure them by looking at the effect it has on mountains and things like that. And we 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 know that it can't do what you're describing if our understanding of science is correct. But we do know that if you use the conventional model of the solar system with the you know the sun being a big ball that's far away and the earth being a big ball that rotates on its axis and rotates around the sun then what we see matches that perfectly mathematically perfectly there's no no error whatsoever in what what we see versus uh, what what the model predicts so it's really curious that you know you you you've got this other model the flat earth model that doesn't make any predictions and certainly doesn't make any predictions with mathematical certainty. And yet you somehow prefer the model that you don't even have over the one that actually works a hundred percent perfectly. I mean, it, it works in a certain sense and you're right. It's, it's outstanding at making predictions for like eclipses, things like that, but you don't, um, there, it, there are problems because when you go out and you photograph distances, it doesn't mm. match up with the expectation of curvature. When you look to verify that we're spinning, you can't verify it. And you can argue that it shouldn't be able to be verified. Well, then we get into this, you know, I disagree. But so long as you're not able to verify it, you're looking at a belief in something that you can't prove. You're looking and at that, something that matches a model perfectly with mathematical precision, like the way the sun rises and the moon and the stars. I could do that. I could do that with most religions. I could go out and tell you that, you know, a God created this place and he wanted the birds to be beautiful and he wanted the sun to rise every day. And it's actually a goddess in a chariot or whatever. And it will keep rising every day because she likes getting up in the morning. And then I will exactly tell you what to predict. And I just did it perfectly. And how would, I did how it would you and, predict it though? How would you predict, say, eclipses and uh, well, I could just come up. I could just come up with some religious story that. But that's tells not a prediction, I, though. That that wouldn't tell me, you know, what will happen in the future. Like if 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 I give you the positions of of some stars and whatnot, how do you predict their paths across the sky? Well. People were predicting the path throughout the sky long before they were using the globe model. So I don't know how they did it. And I couldn't do it myself, but I know that it was being done. So I know the globe model is not required to be able to predict celestial you know, occurrences at all. I think it is, actually. I think you will find it. <laughs> they do actually, uh, uh, the accurate paths of the, uh, the stars can only really work on a globe model. If you, want to, if you want to make a mathematical model that shows you where the stars will be in any one day, there's a very simple one, which is globe model. And the stars are very, very far away, essentially on what we call the celestial sphere. This, this is a very simple uh, thing. Yeah, each star simply has two coordinates. You've got these things called polar coordinates, like it's how far around it is and how far up it is. That's all it has. 
And from those coordinates, you can predict its path across the sky. And it's really, really simple. It's trivial almost. And it works perfectly and with, with incredible precision. You can, you can get telescopes and automatically zoom in to where a star is going to be. And the telescope's using a mathematical model inside it that is based on the globe model. So you know, it all works based on the globe. There is no other model in which it works. <laughs> I mean, it, well, it's, it's just not true. There's so many former belief systems that made all sorts of astrological predictions and they didn't use the globe. Well, let's, I mean, I, let's just stick with something very simple, like one star, let's pick one star like Sirius uh, and say, where is it going to be at any particular point in time? None of those old systems uh could predict that. It's just saying it's carried by chariots into the sky. It doesn't predict where it's going to be. But if you want to figure out where it's going to be at, like, say, well, you know, 12 o'clock tonight, we can do that. All right, the chariots in the sky, I wasn't referring to as a specific. I was just making that up. Right. This, this, um, we're but getting the, into an area that is not my expertise. <laughs> I, I haven't studied these yeah. ancient cosmologies, so I, I can't, I can't represent them justly. They need somebody else who study them. Right. I just, I know that, I know that these, there's, I mean, to, to come and say the globe model is the only one that's ever it is, predicted. It is, the, it is the only one that actually accurately predicts the paths of the stars is to assume that we are in the center of a celestial sphere. You could argue that it's not a, you don't need to be on a globe for that to work. But then, why is it the same from every point on the Earth? Why, why, why does why do things? Why can we see southern constellations from South uh, America and from Australia at the same time, and they both look the same? When if the Earth was flat, they would be on opposite sides of the Earth. And, you know, these things they get increasingly ridiculous as you get further and further away from the North Pole and further towards the South Pole, and you have to have this incredible stretching of reality for it to work on a flat earth, but you have nothing to do on the globe earth because it just works. It's just the paths of the stars in the southern hemisphere work out perfectly. It's trivial almost. I would say that this is, there are a lot of people who study the stars in relation to flat earth a lot, like really extensively. And you should definitely um, mm. reach out to them because it's just, it's like, it's just not my expertise whatsoever. So yeah. it's just, it, I, it's not fair for me to represent that side of the conversation since mm. I have only like a passing knowledge of it. But um, I do know that there are people who would love, love to have an in-depth conversation with All you. Right, I'll about send them my way. Okay. I will. I will yeah. for sure. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's, let's talk about um, something else like uh, for a, a bit um, like the coronavirus. Has that changed your view of the world at all? Like, or do you feel like the world is changing in a way that changes your perception of uh, how the world operates at all? Does it change my perception of how the world operates? Because I, I, we were talking to you last time, and we, we talked a little bit about like if the world is flat, would there have to be some kind of big conspiracy? To cover it up, or is it just the scientists uh, making mistakes? And you know, you didn't really know at the time. But um, do you think? Well, let's just just address the coronavirus. Do you think that uh, there's more to it than the media is telling us? Do you think there's more? Well, the media is giving us. Um, do I think there's more to it? Than, what do you think? Can I ask you first? What is your What is your opinion on what's going on? Uh, I, I don't think there's much more to it. I think, you know, it depends which media you look at. If you look at Fox News, initially they tried to downplay it a bit and then they tried to upplay the government's response. But I think overall, basically, it's a, a bad uh, pandemic and um, thousands of people are dying. And uh, it, is, it is a coronavirus that's infecting people and making people sick. So I think it is as the media presents it. So I'm wondering... And how do you feel? How do you feel about just you know all the changes in the laws and yeah. how we're being required to give up you know employment and 
Um, how do you feel about all the changes that are being done in reaction to the I pandemic? Think, I think uh, they're necessary changes based on the science of pandemics and that you know we know what happens if you do nothing and you know, we know how rapidly the disease spreads so we you, we need to do things to avoid um, millions of people dying if we did nothing the prediction is that millions of people would die you know i, I i've already you know i know people like friends of friends who have died already and you see you know famous people who are vaguely famous people who are catching it and dying so i mean it, it is it is a real thing that is actually happening. Uh, I don't think that they're, they're just put, making us stay at home just because they want to control us. You know, okay. Maybe maybe there might be something that comes out of it which is negative, and they they don't give up some of the power. But I don't. I think there's very much a real reason for uh, people to sure. have, be forced to well, stay yeah, at home. People can do things for real reasons. And what do you and just what do you think about that? Like if you just said a really interesting sentence, like if they. Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I'm trying to. Like, they don't give up something the about them giving. Yeah, like so. What do you mean? Like, what do you mean by that? Well, um, historically, when the government takes power for some reason because of some crisis, they're slow to give that power up. And so, if they put new new laws into place that give them greater surveillance rights, then uh, they might not give up those laws afterwards. So that's something I think we need to be vigilant about and you know, insist that they do and uh, not vote for the people who want to keep those laws. Because they could put laws in place that say uh, they would they, they would track people's cell phones or something like that because they need to do it to track the spread of the disease uh, and then keep tracking people's cell phones afterwards, which is something you don't want, but something that I think we need to be concerned about. But uh, yeah, my, my question for you was more, do you think that there are things that are being done now that is in some ways uh, a power grab? Um, sure. Yeah. I mean, anytime you tell people they have to do things, you're taking power. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you just tell people that you, I mean, that's, but it, yeah. it, they, they have to do it though. If, if, if there's stuff they have to do now, like if we have to go into lockdown, we have to close the schools, we have to tell people not to you know, meet with other people and we, we have to, you know, make businesses close. If this is something that has to be done for health reasons, mm -hmm. uh, do you think that there's people just simply taking advantage of that right now? Or do you think, do you feel like, the reaction is out of proportion to the disease and that these some of these things are necessarily and are just being done for power grab reasons. I think that my ability to analyze what's going on has been all but eliminated by the very fact that I can't go outside. Mm -hmm. So I think that... The real answer is, how would I know? How would you know? I mean, you couldn't go and hug a bunch of people and see if you get sick. I mean, that isn't something you would want to try and do anyway, is it? So it's it's not but, like... And I respect other people's fear. So I wouldn't yeah. even... You know, why would I go experiment with that? Yeah. Like, I'm not going to freak out people. No, no, to, no. Would you... Yeah. Let's, let's say if you could go outside, what what experiments would you do... If you were just given free reign to go around and you know wear a mask or whatever, but go around and, and look, what would you go and look to see if the things were as they're being told us? Would you go to the hospitals? I go and do this is you know I gotta admit this is a wildly new um, hmm. uh, territory because I see the story about people who are questioning this being immediately painted as dangerous. Mm -hmm. And that's coming out in, in, like in neon. Like the, the very, I, I saw that there was a movement about people going to hospitals and filming 
are 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 these particular hospitals that are being said to be overflowed with patients? Are they really overflowed? And people are mm-hmm. going and filming. There's this whole movement about that. So I noticed the movement. I noticed some of the, these videos, people doing that. And within about a day, there were articles coming out calling like uh, calling them assholes, like mm. a, a, and calling them dangerous, and calling them you know deniers of the disease, and calling them uh, like I think citizen journalist was a term that was used, but it was it was used as if these are the new the new threat of people, the new bad mm. people are trying to be citizen journalists. Now I don't think that the um i don't think that's right i don't think that it's healthy to come to a place where people seeking to verify that for themselves are vilified as the enemy now does that mean that the official story is true or not it doesn't it doesn't mean that but it means that people are losing a sense of safety to have an open dialogue or to seek to verify or to right or wrong express their opinion publicly. But what if people are promoting the idea that the coronavirus is, say, a hoax when it actually isn't? And that makes people do things like, I don't know, go to go to some choir practice or something that they wouldn't normally do and then they get sick. Because it seems like there's a big problem with, you know, it's the disease spreading because people are being in close proximity to other people. And if a lot of people start thinking that it's a hoax, isn't that a dangerous thing? Do you think there's there's some some need for uh, caution and perhaps even criticizing people? I think right now there's an incredible need for caution on all fronts. You know, it's just there's a there's a balance. I mean, the word you just used has become a dirty word. Like, like it's, and I don't know that it's the correct word either. I don't, I Which doubt word? that it is <laughs> HOA eggs. I don't think that it's that simple. I don't, um, I don't think it's that simple. I think that people are getting sick. I think that right. people, I think that I think there's this question about um, you don't, you don't <laughs> I, mean, I got to pull back. How, how do you even what is even a safe way to question right now? Yeah, honestly, oh. what is a safe way to question? What is I guess like what what's it's not like what is a safe way to question? Like if, if we could, I mean, obviously you feel worried that people will criticize you or even attack you if you if you express questions because they've done it to other people but uh i guess what from your perspective how how would you be persuaded that it is as it appears to be what what more should it be done by the authorities to make it clear that it's a real thing um i mean i don't know that that unnecessary goal mm. I mean I don't like I mean I, I think you're you're presuming the way you're talking is you're presuming I don't believe in it there's some, there's well, some I'm, I'm, I'm presuming you have some questions because you said like your your ability to to investigate or, or ask questions I'm not sure what you said your ability is being curtailed because you can't go out so I was wondering if you could go out what would be the information you'd be looking for that perhaps could have been supplied to you in some other way? Well, I have um, my closest friend is a nurse practitioner mm-hmm. and um, she works in urgent care. And um, I have a close relative who lives in Seattle, like near the epicenter, as they call it. Yeah. And um, I have you know friends in various places and I guess I've been checking up um, with like with my friend who works in a clinic, my my nurse friend, you know, from mm. the beginning, I was like, tell me, 
tell me if you get uh, for you know I'm concerned about her and, and I I, I want to know do you see have you seen any patients with this diagnosis you know that's that's always something to ask every time yeah, we yeah. check in with each other. And um, the first the first time we talked about it, she she told me that she doesn't have they haven't been given any protocol for how to handle it if they mm. do get one, and they weren't given any masks. She had to buy her own masks and bring it. You know, to this day, she said there's been people with some slight fever and some coughing. So there's like it's like maybe, but they haven't had anybody that they can verify would. Um, for sure have it or whatever. And I asked her about the kids and the testing kids and they didn't get any. And I, I was just asking her about the testing kit because I'm not a medical professional. So I was like, what, what are you getting? Like, what do you think this kit is demonstrating? Like, how do you, how would you use one? Like, basically, like I was asking as a doctor, cause she basically takes on the role of a doctor, but yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. Desperation is practically doctors yeah so as a doctor as a nurse like you know generally you can diagnose people like you can either diagnose them in in the room when they come in or you do your lab work and you can you know diagnose them through that but you know what to look for you know what what results you're looking at and um she said yeah and she's like yeah if somebody has something generally she has the capacity to diagnose it but she does not have that capacity with this. Like she wouldn't, she wouldn't have that power to diagnose. And like there, if they did a test kit, it wouldn't go like to their lab. There's like, I don't know, specified places that they're being sent off to right. or whatever. So there was a, a lack of power to know, you know, I'm asking somebody who's a doctor, basically, who's my very close friend, how is this being verified? And she didn't say, oh, it's, you know, I can't. She, she just like said, like, it, I don't, we don't get to verify it. We don't have that. Mm-hmm. They're not giving us that power. So um, what does that mean? I don't know. It just, yeah. <laughs> but it is, you know, what, what do you do with that? I don't know. So then, you know, I look up other um, information and, there seems to definitely be such a thing as coronavirus. Like this is like a known thing that's been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, you can't, it'd be pretty much a stretch to say there's no such thing as a coronavirus, but um, I don't take it lightly. Like I know that <laughs> getting sick is horrible. Um, so yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I don't think that I have the information to know. I think that it's, there's a lot of, I can see that people are being, well, they're certainly being encouraged to take exactly what the news is saying for beta. That's the main, that's the main push. But I also can see that there are um, there is a sort of side push that maybe just controlled up, maybe just people out to sort of rabble rouse, encouraging people to say it's not it's not something to be worried about. Hmm. And I don't think, and I and I think that there it's I think that that is there to vilify any form of questioning. Um, and I see that really clearly, actually. So, so do you think that they've created this, this, this questioning environment specifically so they can attack people who ask questions? Uh, I don't know that it's like for that, but it seems to be um, something that's going on. Yeah. I mean, just like you were saying about power, you know, they're taking power. I think that that's one, one of the ways they're taking power and they're making it really scary. You know, they're, they're saying like, if, I mean, I mean, she's, you know, like, it's like for your, the position you're taking, 
You can talk day in, day out about it publicly. You're just fine. I'm not even taking a position. I'm saying I don't have the freedom to know okay. or to ask questions. And in that, like that's that's a that's a power grab. You know, I don't have the luxury of saying much of anything really. It 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 well, is there are quite a, a lot of questions being asked like if you think like say the the issue with face masks things have changed over the last uh, like week or so with people's uh, the, the officials opinion about face masks and part of that has come from people questioning uh, the official you know advice not to use face masks so in that sense there is something that was questioned some official thing that was questioned and enough people questioned it and then they figured out that you know perhaps their original advice wasn't the best advice, or at least not at this time, and they changed it. And I don't, people weren't really vilified for questioning, like is is wearing face masks a good thing or not? Awesome. I didn't see that. I don't. Um, but maybe you're correct about that. Um, I don't know. You know, it's like it's just it's a new day, and mm. I think that you know it. I've been thinking a lot about that. Gosh, there's that poem about like the rise of the Nazi Germany where it's like, first they came for them. I did nothing. Mm -hmm. And then they came for them. And I, I, I think that that's what this feels like to me is um, they are there. There is a feeling of there's, there's vilification of questioning right. And, and that's, you know, if you think, well, if you question the virus, you could be encouraging people to go out and smear each other's faces and then more people are going to be sick. And so it's like, well, maybe that's good. You can't question the virus. And it's like, well, there is a certain logic to that. And that there might is, be your opinion. An argument. You're gonna hold. Yeah. But, um, but that is also a power that you're surrendering, which is the right to question and that may not be a power that is given back. And it may come around to a place where you can't ask a question that you want to ask. And somebody else may be rationalizing that your question is too dangerous. And, you know, yeah. I support your right to say we live in a globe. I support your right to say anything, really. And I think this is the time for people to reflect, can they support a free discourse because we are losing the right to have free discourse right now. We are losing the feeling yeah. of safety. Free discourse. It's, it, there is, there is, I think always going to be a line that needs to be drawn at some point uh, with free discourse. Like if somebody is telling people to drink poison because it will cure something, uh, you know, some toxic system, systems, substance like that, or they're advertising one thing but selling something completely different that some actually is harmful doesn't work or they're selling fire extinguishers that don't have any fire extinguisher stuff in them if 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 there we, we have to have some limits uh to what sure. people can there, say yeah, there were lines there are lines i would never so, cross yeah but it's moving the line is moving somebody's out there saying that you know it's okay to murder people i'd say no no it's not yeah. you step yeah. back or Somebody said racism was okay or child abuse was okay. Like, no, absolutely, there are lines. But it's like, if you want to go, if there, mm, see, it's really, it's, it's hard to see. Where do you draw the line? How do you decide where the line is drawn? And it, the line always gets drawn in an area that's fuzzy because you can't, there isn't a clear cut division between one thing and the other. So there's always going to be some people that will say the lines should be that way or that way. There is a lack of respect for the general populace. That is absolutely, mm. absolutely going on. The media is treating people like prisoners, like because they're saying, I mean, they're using the dialogue, the, the dialogue, the um, the vocabulary. They, they're saying lockdown. This is a psychology of prisoners, and and they're this this whole idea of like, well, we're releasing the national guard, but don't worry, they're just there to be nice. For now, so there's there, there's this taunting of the people that mm. the people must stay in line, or you know, or what you know, you don't know. But yeah. there, this this is a psychology 
of control. It's a psychology of taking power. And does it mean that the emergency is not an emergency? No, it doesn't mean that. But, but it, but but it is, it is a power grab. It's absolutely a power grab. And here's here's a power uh, a problem with a power grab, is um, the world is full of intelligent people. The world is full of goofy people with terrible ideas, but it is also full of intelligent people. It is very possible that there are people who could devise a better plan for dealing with this crisis than the plan that is being implemented. You're, you're asking people everywhere to give up their livelihood. You're asking people to just submit, submit on a spiritual level really right now. Just, just say, okay, I don't know better. You tell me what to do. You're asking people to not know how to pay their rent. You're asking people to, in many cases, not know where they're going to, how to, have enough money to get food very soon you're asking people to do um to to just be quiet and hide away and to stop socializing to stop having conversations to surrender all sorts of things that generally support their health and generally support their mental health you ask people to give all that up because government knows best now Mm. there's the possibility that the people could know better (laughs) The people could think of a different plan or a better plan if they are given the freedom to assess the information, to have free discourse, to safely say, wait, is this the best plan? Can we take care of our people's health and also take care of our economy? You know, there yeah, are- but how, how, are we, how are you going to get to that from here? Like we we're in a situation where you know, you're in you got like two months or something in which to act. What do you actually do? How do you you can't just say okay, people, you figure it out. You know, there's this deadly disease coming, and other people say, well, other people will say, oh no, there isn't, and then people will just act as normal. They're not going to do anything. Does it ha- does I- it have to be one or the other? I mean, does it does it have to be one or the other? Like to say this plan might not be the best plan for everybody. Does that have to mean that you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater and you're saying there's think, no problem to solve? I think there is there's certainly uh alternative plans, but it, it's it isn't it certainly doesn't have to be complete lockdown versus complete freedom. Uh there could be okay. things in between. I have a, a close friend who um he called me up the other night. He's got he's got a lot of health issues. He has mm. diabetes and like some related stuff. And he was um, he's very he said he was very ill. He hadn't been able to get out of bed for like four days, and he was having a lot of trouble breathing. And oh, wow. he went to the ER. This was like maybe three nights ago. He went to the ER, and um, they did not test him for Covina. Or um, Corona, sorry, I don't get the words missing. They did not test him for Corona, and um, they wouldn't put him into the ER. And he, you know, he was like begging them to, and he, they said, "Well, you don't want to go in there and mix with the other patients." Mm. And he um, he asked them if they actually had any Corona patients at the time, and they said, "No, but you can't go in there." And um, he actually. Uh, he had some kind of like acidosis, like diabetic acidosis thing that was giving him, making him unable to breathe. I guess he had to go back to several ERs over the next few days to try to get treatment. And he said that normally if he would have been sick like that, they would have put him in to a room in the ER and put him on an IV and like kept him there for a few days until he leveled off. But that he, he felt like they were like came near kill him because they wouldn't, they basically wouldn't treat him appropriate, give him appropriate treatment, Mm -hmm. adequate treatment. And, um, he, you know, that I know that he's not the only one suffering in a very real immediate way as a result of these kind of changes going on. So like, if it is, is this, is this an appropriate correction? Are, Are the are the 
<laughs> like, okay, so there are many problems in this world. There's poverty, there's malnutrition, there's abuse, there's, and that's, you know, I'm not covering everything at all. I can't list all the problems that are going on. But people are in crisis all the time. Um, I mean, I look at this situation and I'm like, why didn't we just stop the world because of diabetes? <laughs> like, diabetes is huge. Why didn't everybody just stay inside until... Because well, it, it wouldn't do anything. By, by staying inside, you're saving 2 million lives over the course of a year. Is you know, that's the basic science of why people are are social isolating and why everything's been shut down. You know, as I it guess, is, I guess, gonna... point, I guess my point isn't necessarily that diabetes is contagious and that. Um, but what I'm what I what I mean to say is that there are a lot of problems and there are a lot of people are, suffering. Yeah. And if if the governments cared like they are suddenly caring about this there should be a lot more corrections so that people don't suffer in the way that they do and it's just i think it's just a, in, an incredible imbalance to, to to put huge huge numbers of people into immediate um poverty crisis and unable to get the type of medical care that they need like people can't go in for their own emergent medical emergencies. Like somebody was joking to me the other day, he was coughing and he's like, oh, don't worry, it's not Corona, it's just lung cancer. <laughs> like there are, there are other problems and that is not to minimize a crisis of a pandemic virus, but that is to say that everything else is being eclipsed and we are being taught to passionately focus on this singular problem. And it's, it's, it's a poor balance for the type of, I mean, I see new homeless people on the street. People just had to leave their homes. And I know there's something about eviction, but there's a lot of under the table things that go mm -hmm. on and people can't maintain, people can't maintain with this going on. Um, they're yeah. like, it, it, people are being put into immediate crisis. And I, I, it's, it's. No, I see then, what you're saying. It, yeah, it's, the, is the, is the cure worse than the disease is, is an argument, but we do know the scale of the disease and to some, to some degree, like it's hard to know what the, the negative effects of the, the cure would be like, say like we let these 2 million people die, including like hundreds of thousands of young people uh and you know lots of people in the workforce and we completely destroy the 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 capabilities of all the hospitals because they'd be they have 10 times as many uh people in them as we have uh now based on the lockdown so nobody would be able to get any any medical attention and we do that uh for a while but everybody's still allowed to go to work and, and is allowed to socialize uh, is does this seem does this seem better yeah, you know, what what are the actual options here? Because the the option of doing nothing doesn't sound very good. The option of doing less, you know, we could we could be doing more. We could actually be really forcing people to stay down. I went for a, a drive yesterday and I saw there was people everywhere. There's some states haven't even done lockdowns yet. We could be doing way more than we're doing right now. Yeah. Los uh, Angeles we, could be, we can't go, we can't do much of anything. They closed all the parks. Yeah. It's very, very dystopian here. Um, well, I think they're maybe shutting down the more dense areas before. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's pretty yeah, wild. No, it's, it's, it's terrible what's happening. Like, you know, it's terrible that all these people are dying and it's terrible that everybody's locked down and the, the economy is like crashing. Like, you know, all these companies are going bankrupt and people are going to be losing their jobs and people are not able to pay rent and you know, maybe not even buy food. Uh, but, you know, we're stuck between a rock and a hard place, I think. And we had to make the decision basically like, you know, save a million lives now versus uh you know, have major economic problems as we can deal with major economic problems down the line we can't just bring these million people back well, to life you know maybe you can <laughs> you know there's a difference in perspective for somebody right. who is, yeah i'm talking is about the country so. 
Yeah. Yeah, but I think um, most most people, if you're asked, like, you know, would you rather keep your job or a million people die? Uh, you know, obviously that's a bit <laughs> disproportionate. Would you rather, like, or everybody kept their jobs and a people, million people die? Because these, these are the types of numbers we're talking about here. We are actually, you know, the, the issue is, you know, hundreds, 100,000 people versus 1 million or 2 million people. So it's uh, pretty, pretty significant numbers of deaths getting, that we have to put in the equation. Where are you getting the numbers? This, this is just basically extrapolations of what's happened in other countries uh, if nothing is done. So you measure the rate of increase of the disease before the measures are put into place and then you see what happens when the measures are put into place it the curve flattens off but if those measures are, you, are not put are into place it carries on are you comparing the numbers with the um you know like a control do you have a control like how many how many deaths are normally occurring yeah the, well you, you do you do because you, you you have the deaths from this disease uh, that are directly attributable to this disease, and yeah, you can, you can mean, look at the actual. That, yeah, you can look at the like, actual death when, rates. What are the, what is the what is the comparable for the control numbers, um, to now? That's I'm just I'm not seeing that in the like I, I yeah, took right. statistics in high school, and I know. Well, I know like, how, I know how to how manipulate. How many people? Not, how many I'm people generally like, die on a cruise when you, you go on a cruise? You need, Control numbers. How many people generally die when you go on a cruise? I don't know. Probably very yeah. few. Yeah, hardly any. Less than less than less than one usually. And the yeah, like coronavirus. Yeah, somebody will get a heart attack because there's like old people on the cruise. But yeah, you know, when the coronavirus gets on a on the ship, they're carrying people off in body bags. They got I think it's like seventeen people died on that, that cruise ship. Which is very very unusual, and and that you you can just take that simple percentage of of the num the percentage of people who died on that cruise ship, and the fact that you know it spread rapidly through the cruise ship even when they they locked people down, um, yeah, because they they didn't lock people down initially, it spread throughout the entire ship, and you could you could use that as a simple experiment, but you could just look at all the different countries that we have now. We have experience of what actually happened in each country. And in the countries where they they institute lockdowns sooner, then that you get less cases. Uh, and if they, they they didn't do it, then you get more cases. You're going to get countries like Brazil where they're being very slow doing things, and it's going to be it's going to be very bad there. I, Iraq, uh, Iran is is going to have problems. North Korea probably does have problems because you know they're just not telling us about it yet. So you know the you know I I the entire world's epidemiological community is focused pretty much on this one thing right now. And they're pretty much speaking with one voice. All the different people in all the different countries. There's differences of, you know, various different what approaches. You, what do you think but, about that in terms of, I know we talked once and you were certain that um, there's a lot of independence within media, that different media sources is, they're not all of one like mind. And mm. I was saying it, I think that they are. What do you think what do you think now with them all having an identical stance on the situation that there's no there's no differing opinion on the appropriate response among because media the sources? appropriate response is is clear and it's uh, it's being hammered home by the reality of the disease that people are dying uh, of this disease and you you might not see it and you, you must, your nurse practitioner might not be seeing it yet but it is actually really happening like uh, I know people who have had their, their relatives die. You know, several people that I actually know in my circle have had relatives die of coronavirus. And you know, one, a friend of mine that I used to work with, his brother just died. And his brother was like 50 years old and he didn't really have anything wrong with him. And then now he's, he died in, a, in like two weeks. Very, so it, very, it is actually happening. Yeah. It is actually happening. Yeah, well, I, have, I haven't said to you that I don't think it's happening. So you don't have no. to... But I think that the severity that the 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 speaking with one voice, they're speaking with one voice because uh, what they are saying is the reality that this is a very serious disease that is going to kill lots of people if we don't do anything about it. And what about the, the, what about the conversation beyond that question? You know, 
what if that what if that is not something that they would naturally disagree on? But what about the conversation about the effects on various populations of people from the um, you know the yeah, forcing everybody to give up their employment mm. and um, these kind of things? Like you would think that certain media sources would take up. Um, they are though. I mean, look at like, Fox News. That. Like uh, Trump has said, like a few weeks ago, he was talking about how the the cure cannot be worse than the disease, and we really want to get people back to work uh, as soon as we can. Uh, he was very much like of that mind two weeks ago, and now I think because of the incredible rate of increase of of deaths in New York, you know, he's basically realized that that was the wrong approach. But the media was talking all about that. Fox News, you know, they, they basically repeat whatever Trump uh, says and vice versa. Uh, they, they were very much saying, you know, this is overblown. We should put people back to work. We don't need to shut everything down. It's a mistake to shut down the schools. It's a mis mistake to shut down churches. People were talking about it. But reality has just hit home, I think. Okay. I mean, okay, like y you... You got what you want then, right? <laughs> the world is working <laughs> the way I you want, want it to work. <laughs> Isn't that, so, no, I think the world is just working the way, the way the coronavirus wants it to work in that, uh, you know, coronavirus is just this blind, brutal force that's been un unleashed in the world from, uh, you know, somebody eating a bat or whatever, whatever however it happened. You, were you hoping, did you reach out to me because you were hoping that I would take a um, an opposite position to you about well, I, the Well, I reached out to you because you know, you have this this very unusual worldview in that you think that the world is probably flat and you think it's not a spinning ball in, in space. And then something happens like this, this, this very big event that kind of changes the world. And I'm wondering what your perspective on that was. Does it make you... And in a way, like engage more with the world in a more realistic way, or does the way you think about the shape of <laughs> the earth? I don't. Well, you're. It's so funny. I I don't know that I've ever not been engaging in, with the world in a realistic way. I mean, I don't know. The well, way, if you tell you, people you're a flat like, earther, people might disagree with that. But is that is that engaging with the world? I guess that's kind of semantics. But the way you think about the world. Uh, you 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 think that I, the world have, is not a globe that the majority of people do not share. Yes, yes, I do. I have numerous opinions that the majority of people do not share. Yeah. But you also think that all the scientists are wrong. No, I don't think. I don't, lying. It, no, I've never said that. You've never so, you've never heard me say that. You've never heard well, me I, say that. I asked I asked you like what you, what you think is going on with all these scientists. Like yeah, you know, they say there's, there's there's millions and millions and millions of scientists, and they all think that the world is round. Or so are they all mistaken, or are they all lying? Like it's it's never really clear They're to me what lying. you're. They're not lying. There's I it's it's a given that nobody is going back and figuring out how to verify. You they're think it's just, doing they're the wrong. science that they're doing. Yeah. And focus on there. You can't get a degree in verifying the shape of the world. That's not an but active field of a science. Lot of, a lot of the science that they do verifies it automatically. It's just because it's they use the flat the, the globe Earth model. Because when they do when they do something like I don't know surveying mountains or whatnot, they have to use a model of the shape of the Earth. So all these scientists have to use the globe Earth model because it's the only one that actually works. Well, so it's in really a way they're verifying it. You can, go, you can go and talk to various scientists, and when you actually get down to it, I have not heard anybody say that their science is dependent on the globe model. People, people say, I mean, I'm not talking about like um, people who are studying space. I'm talking about um, even people who study like land surveyors or whatever. They work with the flat Earth model, but they just assume they that that's just a shorthand and they don't need to work with the globe model because Do you, have you checked that though have you actually looked any any books on surveying because I, I looked at the like i the... can send you a video of somebody calling up all sorts of land surveyors and asking them if they use the globe model and they all say that they don't need to they don't need to because they're only surveying like plots of land if what if the what about map makers people who make maps how do they 
Oh, that lying? would be awesome. I'd love to talk to a map maker. That would. Where are the map yeah. makers these days for large scale? The, the, they work in something called method, uh, right? G- GIS because it's all done digitally now. I mean, it used to be done right. obviously with the paper, but it's all done digitally. So. Well, tells you something then you just okay the computer told me like there's <laughs> that you, if you're not going out and checking it physically mm-hmm. for yourself then you're you're not engaging in that area of science and that doesn't mean you're not doing real science i'm not saying that anybody out there who's doing science isn't doing science they're doing their science i have friends who are in the field of science like that's they're they are doing what they're doing but right. and they're not lying i'm not calling them liars at all they, it's it's that they're not testing what about for, that that's less. not it's, that would be silly for them they they don't think that there's a need for that and so they're off studying very specific things that um yeah. are separate questions so if someone say worked in the gps industry you think you could actually work in the GPS industry as a, a I don't know, someone who calibrates GPS systems or, 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 or does the algorithms for working out how to drive from one place to another or fly from one place to that? Do you think they could actually do that without, uh, without figuring out what the actual shape of the Earth is, without things going wrong? Because all the all the math they do, is, you know, the math isn't very complicated. I they, would they love assume... to hear from somebody who works. On GPS and has physically, physically. assessed the <laughs> shape of the world and doesn't just get it from a computer screen. From if you the, can from find the Google it, Earth. Hmm, that's an interesting, Earth. interesting way of putting it. All right. Well, we've been we've been talking for an hour and a half, and I I have to go because my wife is cooking dinner. Okay. Uh, so. And so it's been very interesting, and I you know I kind of look forward to hearing. From you again in a few months, like I'll say six to twelve months, uh, when the yeah. Corona stuff is kind of have the freedom to speak out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's, let's so hope whatever if... power they take. Let me ask you: Do you do you hope that they give back some of the power they're taking? Oh, right definitely. Now? Yeah, yeah, and I I I hope that you know, it doesn't. Uh, yeah, there aren't re- too many repercussions down the line in terms of the authoritarian nature of the state. Uh, but, you know, I was, I was worried about that before. You would say that it does feel like an encroaching authoritarian state then? Well, it, I think it's, I think the the uh, encroachment is necessary. Like I've, I've described before, I think it's a real, really bad disease and, it's, and it is actually necessary to take these steps. But I think there is a danger that people might take advantage of that and not give back powers that are, are granted to them in the future. And this will vary by country as well. Mm-hmm. Like some, some countries are more authoritarian than others. Uh, hopefully the checks and balances in the United States can uh, prevent that to some degree. But I guess we'll see. Let's, let's talk again in, in a year and see where we're at. I agree with you that that is the primary concern right now, that we right. aren't losing power through this crisis okay thank you enjoy your dinner well yeah you you say stay safe and uh uh we'll talk to you talk to you again hopefully okay all right thank you okay bye